Atlantic seaboard one fine morning in 1943, an imposing force of American naval air power proceeds to an important rendezvous. This force is the aircraft complement of a new carrier, fighters, dive bombers, torpedo bombers. With the air group commander leading everyone, they are flying out to sea to join the ship which will be their floating home and fighting base is one of many carriers which the American people have built since Pearl Harbor to destroy the enemy in his own part of the world far away. And there now is our base, powerful and serene. In honor of all American aircraft carriers, let us call her the Fighting Lady. Against a good solid wind with their tail hooks down, our planes come into the broad flight deck of their new home. In case the plane's hook fails to catch the arresting gear, there is a series of stout wire barriers. Number one man on the flight deck just now is the LSO, the landing signal officer, always a flyer himself. Like all aviators, he'd much rather be flying. Come on in and sit down. The plane is out of the groove and he waves it off. Come around another time, pilot, and we'll take you aboard. When planes land, they taxi quickly forward out of the way. Later, they'll have to be shifted to the stern and rearranged in proper position for takeoff. This is called respotting the deck. Here is our skipper, Jocko, a veteran Navy flyer, Annapolis 1917. He is not impressed by our earnest efforts, nor the flight deck control officers. The skipper calls all hands together and gives us a piece of his mind. We'll never be ready for combat unless you flight deck crews learn right now to work as a team. Don't you men realize that before long we'll be in dangerous waters? That's too slow. Bear a hand. Watch out. Keep that wing clear.
Get it over to starboard. Way over to starboard. Come on, get the lead out of your pants. Now, this is the way your deck should look when you're ready for action. Our ship, our fighting lady, is enormous, wonderful, and strange to us. From stem to stern, the entire ship is a honeycomb of watertight and flame-proof compartments. Far below the waterline are engine rooms, fire rooms, fuel tanks, and magazines packed with enough assorted high explosive to blow us all to kingdom come. The hangar deck is like a gigantic tunnel, nearly two city blocks long and wide enough to house four freight trains abreast. It'll take us a week, a month maybe, to learn our way around. These new surroundings are as mysterious to us as they are cold and impersonal. Our fighting lady is like a huge floating cave, noisy and uncomfortable. Elevators as big as a tennis court carry us topside to the flight deck. The great superstructure rising amidships is called the island. This is truly the ship's nerve center, its fighting brain. 85% of us who make up the fighting ladies' family are volunteers in this war and have never been to sea before. We learned our jobs theoretically in intensive training ashore. A very short while ago, we were high school boys and college kids or bank clerks or farm hands or factory workers. Now we are blue jackets and marines, all members of a naval combat team nearly 3,000 strong. In our multitude of new tasks and duties as a team, we're very green, but curiosity and comradeship and the instinct of self-preservation are great teachers. Some of us have to master the delicate and complicated instruments which control the fire of our five-inch batteries, the guns that must defend the fighting lady when enemy dive bombers and torpedo planes attack. We train and train to learn our stuff and earn our E for efficiency. The fighting lady's destination is still a closely guarded secret. But no one can hide the fact that we are entering tropical waters. Our ship seems more friendly and comfortable now. And we greenhorns feel that a suntan will at least make us look like fighting sailors. Even our mascot, Scrappy, has been at sea longer than most of us. <laughs> Some of the mystery that has been hanging over us is lifted when we enter the Panama Canal. There is a lot of unprofessional nervousness about whether or not we're too big to get through the locks. By using lines instead of fenders, we do get through. As the naval constructors knew all along, we would. Come on, hop aboard. We're going places. For two cents, I would. Do you know anybody wants to swap? Now we stand out into the Pacific, and life aboard settles down into monotony. Here are our aircraft pilots, officers all. Ship's company call them the Glamour Boys. They are the men who fly and fight our planes. All the efforts of all the rest of us are concentrated on putting these people into the air and getting them back again. Most of us are hiding a certain amount of nervousness and anxiety, for many of us are Johnny-come-latelys. Reserve officers who only recently learned to fly at Corpus Christi in Jacksonville. Others among us are specialists who trained at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Reserves are called by the regulars, in a friendly way, 90-day wonders. In return, the Annapolis regulars are called the trade school boys. But whether Quonset or Annapolis, all are bound together in the fraternity, the close fellowship of Navy men.
Among the ship's non-commissioned personnel, almost 3,000 Blue Jackets and 100 Marines, the hottest shots are the air crewmen, aerial gunners and radio men. These boys and the plane captains are the partners of the glamour boys in the air. By non-flying Blue Jackets, they are called Zoom Pigeons or Airedales. And because they receive 50% extra pay for flying, they are sometimes referred to as the Bankroll Boys. Everybody aboard ship backs up the flying group. This requires the efforts of all manner of people. Many of the jobs are far from glamorous. All the little tasks and services you find along Main Street must be performed by some members of our carrier's crew. For though the fighting lady is a powerful ship of war, she is also a sizable American community whose population must be supplied with all the necessities and some of the comforts of home. Doc Sorensen, the pharmacist's mate, is just like a village druggist. And next door is our hospital called Sick Bay. It has only a few patients now, but soon it is to be filled with our wounded. Men like these who perform the humble jobs that make life aboard a fighting carrier more bearable, the barbers and the cobblers, are seldom mentioned in communiques. They all have a place in our fighting team. Weeks pass. Now we are far out into the Pacific, which is a very considerable body of water. Monotony shuts down on us between our duties. Guessing where we're bound is still our chief pastime. Will we put into Pearl? Are we going to Iron Bottom Bay? Or maybe even to the Aleutians? All such gossip and rumor are called scuttlebutt or drinking fountain conversation. Throughout the ship, men get together in little groups to take refuge from the heavy burden of waiting for something to happen. And then one day out of nowhere comes a fast fleet tanker and we're refueled at sea. This tells us something. This tells us that we are not going to Pearl or any other land base for a long, long time. Besides our skipper, we have an admiral aboard, a sea dog who's been a naval flyer for nearly 20 years. Until now, only these officers have known where we are to go. But now Jocko, our captain, confers with the air group commander and reveals the plan. The fighting lady has been ordered to make a strike. She will pass through waters where no carrier task force has ventured since the bloody Battle of Midway. Remember, this is 1943, long before we took the Marshall Islands. Weather studies are made, and though this is a daily routine, somehow the whole ship senses that something is about to happen. Even before the news is broadcast to all of us, there's a new tension and atmosphere of expectancy. And then we are told, we have traveled more than 7,000 miles from Panama, so that tomorrow... August 30th, 1943, we can strike the Jap base at Marcus Island, deep within the enemy's ring of defenses. The evening before our first strike, the air group commander briefs all his pilots with maps and a model of our target. We are sticking out our necks to within a thousand miles of Tokyo to divert the Japs' attention from other American activities far south and east of Marcus. Those of us who have never before been in battle, that's most of us, ask a lot of questions of those who have seen action. Your seat gunners, don't break off until you're practically on the same course and right astern of the enemy. Then push over fast. Outwardly, we try to seem composed and cheerful, but a lot's going on inside our minds. We question our most inner selves. What'll it be like? How'll we take it? Will we do all right? This is the night when a lot of boys write one more letter home.
Among those playing Acey Ducey in the ward room is a chubby 23-year-old from Eureka Springs, Arkansas, Lieutenant E.T. Stover, nicknamed Smokey. That's he sitting on the far right. Having flown 50 missions at Guadalcanal, Smokey has been ordered to take a rest. He'd much rather be flying. Before dark on the eve of battle, our planes are loaded with bombs and gas. So that each plane will be in its precise position for a speedy takeoff, we spot and respot our deck. Now all is perfect. We will strike at dawn. And now, GQ, General Quarters. Every man on the ship goes to his battle station, his special place on the fighting team. George, the barber, will pass ammunition. Leo, the baker, will be a sky lookout. Frank, the tailor, is assigned to a first aid station. Pilots are in their ready rooms. Each squadron, fighter, bomber, torpedo bomber, assemble separately. The flyers get into their flight gear and receive last minute data and instructions. On the flight deck, our first battle dawn awaits us. Our whole ship is on hair trigger. The fighting lady is hardly 100 miles from the first target of her career. These last few minutes before the order for our first action are the toughest time of all. A wise man once said, war is mostly waiting. We learn now what that can mean. At last, the word comes. Pilots, man your planes. Ready room three, Roger. Pilots, man your planes. take off first to form cover aloft for the other squadrons. Then the bombers, heavy laden with destruction. The sun has risen now and our escorts are alert for enemy submarines. But the fighting lady steams boldly toward our target to lessen the distance for our planes when they return. The radio plotting room is the electric eye and ear by which the fighting lady detects and keeps tab on all planes and ships for miles around us. Smokey, the fighting ace from Arkansas, has been put in charge of this room for our big day. Punched among his assistants, Smokey is like a super quarterback on a super football team. He is in constant touch with our entire air group. As our first fighters race in toward Marcus Island, they stay low, hoping to escape detection by the enemy's radar. Then they climb suddenly and dive surprise strafing attack on the enemy's airstrips. These red balls floating up at us so lazily are anti-aircraft fire. There is three times as much of it coming up at us as we can see, because only one shell in three is a tracer. What look like fiery polywogs are tracers from our own wing guns. The ak is much heavier than expected, but through it we go to knock out enemy bombers on the ground. 
All through these battle pictures, realize that we are looking straight down our own gun barrels. These pictures are taken automatically by the same mechanism that operates the guns. The pictures even shake with the gun's recoil. Our eye is now the very eye of our fighting airplane. The enemy's picket boats and supply ships offshore are thoroughly scraped. No longer will these craft bring rice and sake and munitions to Marcus. flying higher, see the island beginning to burn. A moment ago, it looked like a little jade trinket in a cobalt sea. As the fighters and bombers swing victoriously away from Marcus Island, towering columns of smoke show the thorough job our boys have done. Back aboard ship, Smokey is tracking the flyers with care to be sure that none is missing and that no enemy planes are trying to follow them out to our fighting lady. As our planes come aboard, there begins an operation almost as exciting as the attack itself, a ballet after battle the plane directors as dancing masters. The whirling propellers fill this scene with danger, but now our crews are trained and adept. The landing signal officer performs an eloquent adagio on the fighting lady's stern. Warning to the rest of the cast to stay off stage until a limping member can be led out of the way. Pilots go below to report to their combat intelligence officers. They have hot news, good news. They tell what they saw and did. How many rounds of ammunition they fired. How many bombs they dropped. What they hit. What they noticed at the target that was new and different or that may need hitting again. As the reports are added up and our combat photographers develop their pictures, the story becomes better and better. Every single Jap bomber on Marcus has been destroyed. 80% of the shore installations blasted or set afire. Hangars, radio stations, gas dumps, ammunition dumps. Marcus is now a lovely mess. In the radio plot, Smokey's worried. There are planes still up there and he's wondering about them. They are ours though, delayed by battle damage. Landing a shot-up plane on the carrier is a crucial test of how well-trained, how alert and steady a naval flyer is. The fighting lady now has met her enemy. In the wardroom, the pilots who this morning felt new and nervous now talk like veterans. We have been baptized by fire and have survived nicely. We of the fighting lady are growing up. The admiral of our task force knows the overall strategy of the whole Pacific campaign. To smash straight through Japan's outer network of islands, to recapture the Philippines and land on the mainland of Asia. Thus, we will deny Japan supplies from Malaya and the Dutch East Indies and leave her far-flung island garrisons marooned. Then, we will reach out and really help our ally, China. Months after Marcus, this campaign is well started. Our carrier task forces have been in many battles. 
And now, early in 1944, the fighting ladies' target is Kwajalein, the Marshall Islands. These are Jap Zeros, fighter screen being pierced by our planes and planes from eight other carriers, preparatory to strafing Kwajalein and bombing it apart. Our fighter pilots have improved with practice, with the confidence that comes from experience. They estimate their range by watching their tracers. They hold their fire until their wing gun bullets converge at 300 yards. Shoot in bursts instead of in steady streams, which heat up the guns and spend ammunition. Kwajalein burning, very satisfactory. After our bombing attacks and heavy shelling by our surface ships, assault craft filled with Marines and Army hit the beaches. And very soon after that, Kwajalein is ours. Kwajalein, word comes to our admiral that at Truk, Japan's huge and secret naval fortress 1,400 miles to the west, there apparently are some heavy units of the Japanese battle fleet. Perhaps we can surprise them. Again, the fighting ladies' squadron and squadrons from other carriers take off for combat. A lot of mouths are dry at the thought that our target is mighty Truk. The rear seat gunners look back at the fighting lady, wondering when and if they will ever return to her. All that we know about truck, we know from a few photographs taken by some nervy marines on reconnaissance just 18 days ago. We hear that it is a complex of heavily fortified islands surrounded by airstrips with naval anchorages at certain spots among the islands. For the next two days, more than 1,000 of our carrier-based planes are going to sweep in on truck in relays. The planes appear to float gently off our bow. Actually, their airspeed is a good 70 knots. Diving in on truck, we again turn on our guns and their synchronized cameras. Truck's defenders are aloft and we smack them hard. that were in men's mouths before this strike began now settle back into place and are singing once more. There's something really grand, something historic about diving in here on this place which Japan has been building and guarding jealously from all the Japanese eyes for 20 years. We dive right in low and take a good look at fighter strips, bomber bases, and seaplane ramps. In an almost vertical dive, the pilot may black out or go blind for a moment when he pulls up and out at the bottom. But the camera won't black out. It cannot see the landing of our own bomb, for we'll be up and away before that reaches the target. But it records the hits of other planes ahead of us.
find the Jap fleet here, but most of it's gone. Some lingering ships, including some of their fast fleet tankers, we find hiding in sheltered coves. The vessels which we are now strafing are other fleet auxiliaries. Rice boats, transports, and ammunition ships. With bursts of 50 caliber incendiaries and armor-piercing slugs, we set them on fire, rip them open, often wide enough to sink. ships filled with TNT is not very healthy for pilots who dive too low. But it's hard to tell who's carrying what until the big bang comes. Returning to the deck at 130 miles an hour with a flap shot away... All a pilot can hope to save is his own skin. Here comes our new air group commander. He's had a bit of trouble. His windshield is blotted with blood, and he has to feel his way aboard. Strafing at low altitude, he took a 40-millimeter anti-aircraft burst right in the face. More than 200 wounds, and his plane a sieve. But he'll live to fly again. Some planes will not return, but... Others come back and land somehow, anyhow. Considering the toughness of truck, our losses are astonishingly light. No time is lost getting casualties below. It's a long way from truck to our secret rendezvous in the Marshall Islands. Someday it can be told just where this is. Actually, it is a magnificent new fleet anchorage, an advanced naval base, which we have taken from the Japs and made secure. Now, for the first time, we, who have been operating as separate, relatively small task forces, see assembled the enormous mass of naval power. Over one million tons of American fighting steel. New carriers, new battleships, new cruisers and fleet auxiliaries in an amount which Japan could never conceive let alone produce. That we are able to maintain supply lines over the vast distances of the Pacific is one of the miracles of this war. In the comforting presence of so much power, we relax and refresh our battle-strained nerves. Push my head on you. Hey, Benny, when are you going to die? You got you to swim, hey! Our ship's post office now does really big business. Letters for us at last from home. Letters from us to friends and families. Our sensors know our collective mood, our central hopes and thoughts. The stuff is really getting out here now. I can't tell you much about it, but oh boy. And the more we get, well, the sooner I'll be seeing you. All hands are called together. Our old skipper, Jocko, has been promoted admiral. Our new one's name is Dixie. Men, as soon as I finish talking, we are getting underway. Our fighting lady is now part of what is designated Task Force 58. As you know, our final destination is a place called Tokyo. We'll have to fight hard to get there, but when we drop our hook at Yokohama, I'm going to throw a party. All hands are cordially invited. Our 
task forces are built compactly now around carriers like ourselves with speedy new battle wagons at our side. A carrier skipper never leaves the bridge at sea because carriers and their planes are the first to strike the enemy or to be struck by him. Our aircraft pilots are constantly on call, for despite the mass of power spread out around us, these are still dangerous waters. Our pilots know this all too well, but it doesn't worry them now, for they're seasoned. They know how. There are a lot of new faces among us, but most of these men, too, have been in action. At places like Hollandia, Mili, Joluit, Palau, Rabao, Wake, Meloilap. Our rear seat gunners and radio men are old hands now. Some of their faces are different too because there have been replacements. A lot of them have been made commissioned officers. There's a saying in the Navy that you never learn to love a carrier until she gets hurt. Well, perhaps we don't really love our fighting lady, but we've become mighty fond of her and almost comfortable, almost at home. Occasionally, our shipboard movies bring us that one thing we crave the most, one touch of something utterly American, one deep breath of home. Like Jocko, our new skipper, Dixie, is an old hell-diving Navy pilot. In their battle caps, he and Admiral Mitcher look like big league baseball managers. Northwest we steam, and never before in history has an ocean borne such a weight of naval power. Not a Jutland, not a Japan's proud boast, Tsushima, was there anywhere near the force with which we now assert that this is our ocean. This is our air. And we're seeking the Japanese battle fleet to prove it. With our cruisers and our biggest new battle wagons present, we are strong enough to hope, really to hope, that we may provoke the Japanese fleet into accepting a fight. We're joined by plotting Coast Guard and Navy transports. The Marines again. So, another amphibious assault is cooking. Patrols have spotted an enemy search plane and are after her. He's a big bird. A 20 ton, four motored Kawanishi seaplane, the kind we call Emily's. Miss Emily's a tough old girl. Right now she's screaming for help and telling Tokyo by radio where we are. Hellcats are closing in on it. So long, Emily. Now that the enemy knows where we are, and we know he knows, our brass hats get together on final arrangements for what may turn into another midway. Our objective, the first of many in our drive through to the Philippines and China, will be the Marianas. In battles just ahead of us, we are to make good use of a multitude of weapons, special devices, and techniques which have been evolved through the 30 years since the U.S. Navy first took to the air. Not only did our naval flyers create the aircraft carrier itself, but it was they who devised the torpedo plane and invented and perfected dive bombing. To 
rules about our flight deck so that planes can be quickly armed are all manner of death-dealing objects. 500, 1,000, and 2,000 pound bombs. We have torpedoes and incendiaries and the kind of anti-personnel bombs we call daisy cutters. Some of our bombs are armor-piercing, some for fragmentation. Others have delayed action fuses to prolong the effect of our bombardment for hours after we have delivered it. Here are the new rockets, which pack the same wallop as a three-inch shell. They weigh little, and because there isn't much recoil, they can be fired from planes. On the eve of battle, we are told to scrub up to lessen the danger of infection in case we're wounded. As well as our bodies, most of us prepare our souls. Always on the eve of battle, divine services are held in relays so that every one of our fighting ladies' 3,000 sons has a chance to attend. As the eve before battle lengthens, there is the usual waiting. Again, we're reminded that war is mostly waiting. Because all cooks and bakers must soon be at their battle stations, they work all night long preparing a hearty meal of steak and eggs for our 3 a.m. battle breakfast. We're being attacked. We're being attacked by Japanese torpedo planes skimming in after us wing to water. All they want is one hit on our flight deck. We have nearly 90 planes fueled and loaded with bombs ready for the takeoff. of flame is a burning jack. In this surprise attack, 19 Japs are polished off by our ship's batteries. Not a single carrier is hit. We have been fortunate. So now commences another major moment in the fighting lady's career. Flight quarters sounds. In this modern warfare, the young plane captains are to their pilots what squires were to armored knights of old. In this operation, typical of many more to come, a lot of other fighting ladies will be involved. And nearly 2,000 carrier-based planes, all of them attacking in air groups like our own. Tighten our belts and steady our hands as our Navy makes progressively bigger attacks nearer and nearer the heart of Japan. At his post and radio plot, tracking down enemy planes and cursing the luck that keeps him out of the air, Smokey chafes at being grounded on a day like this, especially when targets are juicy ones. All the Jap air bases and military installations in the Marianas, 
and a special prize package, Guam. The island which we did not fortify, but the Japs did. Now comes word that the Japs have sent strong air reinforcements to Tinian, which flanks Guam. Again, our synchronized cameras record, as no human eye and memory could record, just what our guns and bombs do to the enemy. These pictures enable our air combat intelligence officers to assess the damage as we swoop down upon Tinian. return for more fuel and ammunition, the surface vessels take over. A prodigious naval barrage to prepare the beaches our assault forces are going to hit. Not only our newest, but some of our oldest and proudest battleships are here. The Colorado, the Tennessee, and the USS Pennsylvania, flagship of World War I. to the fighting lady, several of our planes, crippled, make a game attempt to land. Now is when the landing signal officer must judge not only the speed, but estimate the battle damage of planes like these. And flight deck emergency crews firefighters, rescue details, and medical corpsmen exhibit almost incredible courage. of a torpedo plane has been unable to release his load of incendiaries. Burning thermite is spilling out at incandescent heat. In the plane's tanks remain about 75 gallons of high-octane gas. The men who brave this danger to save pilot and crew deserve every citation they get. In the ready rooms, intelligence officers question battle-weary pilots. What did you see? Any Jap carriers in sight? Are you sure they were carrier-based planes? Then from radio plot comes uncomfortable news. Torpedo planes and dive bombers from enemy aircraft carriers are approaching. All hands, man your battle stations. To our engine room go orders for flank speed which is a few knots faster than full speed, in case we need to take evasive action. All boilers are lighted to let the fighting lady outdo herself if necessary. The engine room people turn on the heat, and the propeller shafts churn like fate in their alleys. The fighting lady leaps through the sea on her guard.
Skipper Dixie gears himself for action. And so does wise old Scrappy. And now, here they come. Jill, torpedo bomber, miraculously keeps coming through our wall of flak. He's approaching us fast with a life that must be charmed. Our gunners throw everything they've got, but still she comes. If he ever releases that torpedo... She missed us. Either the pilot was already dead or his release gear jammed. Bulky, the pride of Arkansas, hears about that one. He almost takes off. Now our reconnaissance has spotted the Japanese task forces. This is the moment we've been fighting and praying for. Every plane that can fly and every qualified pilot is ordered into the air. At last, Smokey gets his chance to fly again. Pilots, man your planes. Pilots, man your planes. trade wind is tearing down our flight deck. Our planes strain forward to rise into it. Our entire air group thunders out behind the group commander. Now our fighters run into a smoke Jap fighters, mostly Zeros, sent up to intercept our attack on the Japanese fleet. A mad aerial scramble begins which the boys to this day still call the Mariana's turkey shoot. 369 Jap planes are shot down in this single day to our loss of 22. Japanese plane makers have sacrificed strength and firepower for agility. Their planes disintegrate quickly when you hit them. They have no armor plate as ours have, nor are their gas tanks self-sealing. monkeys are fancy flyers. They think aerobatics can win dog fights, whereas we believe in smooth flying and careful shooting. afternoon haze from high altitude, our air combat group sights the Imperial Japanese battle fleet. 
These are the first pictures ever taken of a great enemy naval formation like this. There it is, that Imperial fleet, crawling around below us in violent, evasive action. Us looking down on them in the seas they think they own. Some of these Japanese ships are scampering away at better than 40 knots. When you bore straight down on them, they twist, squirm. a big destroyer at the bow, hoping to shoot out his bridge, and he shoots back plenty. Let's go down after that cruiser. He answers us emphatically from the forward turret. A 25,000 ton Jap carrier of the Hayataka class is going to get it. Watch 5 o'clock in the camera, the lower right hand corner of the screen. This big flat top gets it where the turkey got the axe. off some of these babies. Just watch this one. And now we come home from the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Seventeen Jap warships have been sunk or severely damaged. Several of our returning planes have been badly shot up. A dive bomber comes in out of gas. He pulls off to starboard but knows it's over because his wheels are down. This pilot has 73 holes in his plane, and his leg almost shot away. To clear the deck for other planes, number 30, badly damaged, is jettisoned, given the deep six. Watch carefully. This man's controls are all but shot away. Steps out of it, smiling. And now it is time to paint up the scores. On this fine morning, just a year after being commissioned, the fighting lady is beginning to look like a stamp album. She has done her share, amassing Task Force 58's grand total of 757 Jap aircraft destroyed in a two-week turkey shoot. But there's another score to add up. Our own casualties. Quite a few faces are no longer with us on the fighting lady. Among them, Commander Upson, skipper of our torpedo squadron. Lieutenant Pappy Condit. Lieutenant John Meehan. And that fighting is gentleman, Lieutenant Smokey Stover. Yes, Smokey's missing too. Salute them under their country's flag. For they were brave.
and they were gallant. Others will come forward to take their places. For the battles we have fought on the seas and in the sky are only the beginning. Still hungry for battle will steam our carrier. Serene, powerful, unafraid. She and her planes will come home again someday, God grant. But not until the bitter, glorious end. For she is, and we salute her, the fighting lady. Thank you.